Welcome back, guys. Um, it's good to be back. It's been a while. It's been a hot minute. Uh, we haven't actually recorded in several, several months, uh, even though we dropped our Philip Sidney video uh, a week or two ago. Uh, that one we actually did back last winter. So uh, we're getting back in the hot seat again. Um, still going to roll podcast style for this one. Uh, thinking about throwing some cameras in in the future. But we do want to start at some point, I know I keep saying this in every video, we're going to start condensing uh, our stuff to give it a little more pre-packaged, composed, uh, shorter kind of thing that summarizes these podcasts. And that'll be something to look forward to in the future and something for us to kind of still figure out and get our feet wet in. Um, but today, I want to talk about uh, what I think is maybe the most important artifact of the period, like... Um, you know, maybe this is a question that's uh, up for debate. Uh, what is the most important literary artifact of the Renaissance, Elizabethan, Jacobian era? Um, maybe just in all English history. Like, you know, m maybe it's the original copy of Beowulf, you know, that got lit on fire in the Cotton Library. Or maybe it's, uh, you know, um, a copy of one of the original uh, um, English Bibles, uh, original King James Bibles. But... I would like to argue that the Henslow Diary, as well as maybe one other artifact that we'll talk about, uh, are maybe the two most important artifacts of the period, and they are going to help us decode and unlock this whole mystery. Maybe we won't solve it like, you know, a genie lamp, but this will be the way for us to finally get in through the door and figure out what all the confusion is with the Shakespeare authorship question. Uh, Brady, you want to join in? Uh, say say hello? Say welcome back or anything? Yeah, of course, yeah. It's been a minute uh, since we actually recorded anything. But yeah, this stuff is always always fresh in our minds. We're always just talking about this stuff regardless, even if we're not recording uh, any of this stuff. But yeah, I'll, yeah, just, yeah we, we get into a frenzy and we go, ah, we got to get this stuff out to the people, you know? But uh, yeah, light chances in. We, yeah, we'll get our phases in here. Uh, you know, kind of be a little more personal, but you know, we're, we're handsome guys. We just we want to be judged, you know, fairly on the content first before you know, <laughs> when to have any, you know, uh, you know, any accidental yeah. sway or anything like that. But uh, so to quote Rick and Morty, sex sells. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but jokes aside, yeah, I um, as like a lay Shakespearean consumer, uh, when you kind of get into the SAQ stuff, I had never heard of this um, this artifact we're going to talk about today. Which, uh, yeah, like we sort of hopefully pitch with all of our angles here is that yeah it just opens up not just the Shakespeare question but the whole Elizabethan time period itself right um, so yeah you want to do the big reveal drum roll about what this thing is okay uh, so we're talking about the Henslow diary uh, let me let me go ahead and pull it up here um, he resumed in already to, to page 13 but I'll, I'll zoom up a little bit uh, this is Walter Gregg's edition and Walter Gregg is a scholar in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, he's a big time, not just Shakespearean name, he's a kind of big time Elizabethan name. He knows a lot. He's a big time archivist. He is a Stratfordian, like pretty much everybody uh, of the era that has big time professorship positions and that sort of thing. Um, but I like Walter Gregg. He's very thorough. He's pretty objective for the most part. You will catch him totally... Uh, romanticizing and pedestalizing Shakespeare, but uh, that's so standard for the time that I can't give him, you know, too much, uh, too much, uh, you know, flack. So uh, that said, this is a big old long intro that he writes to explain how to read the diary because what we have is his transcript. This is not what the diary actually looked like. Philip Henslow did not have typewriter and type print. Uh, if I can get it here. Oh, my bad. Uh, what we have is a lot of handwritten notes, and um, it's mostly in Philip Henslow's hand, but there are signatures from other playwrights. There are um, signatures from other people in the theater business, secretaries and assistants that work for Henslow. Um, but what the diary is, is it is a manuscript or journal. Uh, there we go. <laughs> I finally got to the title page. Uh, it is a manuscript or a journal uh, by a man named Philip Henslow who owned the Rose Theater, which was uh, where most of the Admiral's men played their shows in the 1590s. 
and it's basically the biggest theater in town before the globe hits. Um, the Admiral's Men, I I would like to argue, are every big is uh, every bit as big and important as Shakespeare's Chamberlain's Men, um, and I think we'll see why here as we go through this text. Um, but not only does it just talk about other groups other than the Chamberlain's Men. Um, it is the most thorough and most accurate, um, maybe that's not the way to describe it, it's um, the most elucidating document for how the theater industry worked. Um, so, yeah, I've often said, like, ah, oh, too bad we don't have, like, a Rotten Tomatoes to sort of look back on for this time period and kind of have this sort of, you know, consumer uh, ability to kind of, like, oh, what did people really think of, like, the, you know, the plays back then, and we still don't have those reviews, but yeah, we have some really nuts and bolts, essentially, of the... And the, the, the so, I'm glad you said Rotten, toma uh, Rotten Tomatoes, because um, even though this won't give us a sort of crowd reception, uh, what we will get is, like, a box office mojo. Uh, because pretty much the first half, and it's not all entirely actually the first half of the journal, it's all scattered about, but chronologically, the first half of information in here is all almost box office listings of play titles, what date they played, and how much money they made that night. Um, and then what's nice is even uh, next to new plays, he'll mark an N or an NE to demarcate, hey, this was a new play and it debuted that night. And so we can go through Henslow's diary and see like what the new plays were of that era. And of course, not every play that's around in the Elizabethan times is going to come through this diary. This is only going to be a section of that, and that's something that we're going to sort of discuss. Um, but the second part uh, is maybe even more interesting than the box office mojo, because the second part of this diary is going to be a list of contracts for playwrights or authors, whatever word you want to use, and what plays they're writing and how much he's paying them and kind of what they're doing. Because like he'll delineate between whether it's a writer just writing a play or uh, coming up with a story or uh, making edits or changes to another play or making edits or changes to their own play. And so uh, it's, you know, not... 100% the most descriptive thing, but uh, for, you know, being quick little journal entries, it gives us a lot of, lot of information. And I think that if you take this information and cross-examine it uh, with itself and with other information that we have, we're going to start to disintegrate the whole Stratford man, the whole Shakespeare thing, and we're going to see that this is a group effort and the name William Shakespeare is sort of a band name or a group name or just a pseudonym to put onto um, a collection of plays by a group of writers who I think are probably all represented in this Henslow diary. Uh, so without further ado, before we dive into the text, uh, let me pull up some charts here that I have. One second, by the way, when you when you said Rotten, you were like, oh, good thing you brought up Rotten Tomatoes. I totally thought you were going to be like, oh, that's that's a Shakespeare line or something like that. I was about to, um, <laughs> I wouldn't have been well, surprised. Well, yeah, uh, there's, there's something rotten in Denmark. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, there's something rotten with these tomatoes. But. Uh, there's, there's a pretty famous musical out there called Something Rotten. And, uh, I think of that play when you hear Rotten Tomatoes. So, yeah, they, they, you know, it's, they, there's a connection. Um, okay. What we got here is this neat little chart I made, and it is specifically to list out a timeline of potentially pseudonymous playwrights and poets in the era of the William Shakespeare lifespan. Uh, William Shakespeare is right here smack dab in the middle, very conveniently smack dab in the middle. Uh, I didn't make this chart for him to be in the middle. I just listed out a timeline of people in the Elizabethan and Jacobian era, and wouldn't you know Shakespeare kind of bookends it pretty darn well. Um, so, uh, or maybe not books in, bookends it, but centerfolds it. Um, What's the, uh, remember, didn't you just, what was the, the middle chapter in the Psalms in the Bible? There was like a specific yeah. word or the um, middle, whatever. Okay, yeah, so just, uh, uh, um, from going to our last video, Brady and I are still on the Psalms from uh, doing some Philip Sidney research. And yeah, uh, I don't know if you knew this, but the exact center of the Bible is the book of Psalms. And it's a... Uh, Book 102 and book 103, or sorry, chapter 102 and chapter 103. Um, so yeah, fun fact, and uh, 
There, there's some uh, pretty gnarly, uh, especially if you uh, read the Sydney versions, but you read the King James versions, they're not all that different. Um, they're pretty gnarly, yeah, they're, they're good stuff. Um, I hope, uh, yeah, if you're into poetry, go check out some of the songs. They're very poetic. Uh, that said, uh, this list starts with George Gascon. Um, there may be some other cats that are as big of writers as Gascon at that time, but he's kind of one of the first big playwrights and helps to popularize it as sort of a potentially commercial form. Maybe not standardize this, this whole industry, but be able to show plays, get public support, and get people to spend money at it. Um, and so going onwards, I have other names on here. Not all these people are playwrights. Um, some of these are poets, because we're not only considering... Sorry, guys, my dog's going nuts. Um, we have not just playwrights, we have poets here as well, because uh, we're looking at not just the plays, we're looking at the sonnets. We're looking at Venus and Adonis. Uh, that said, right now, not, not for the whole conversation for the Shakespeare authorship, but right now, in context of the Henslow Diary, uh, we're going to ignore the, the purely poetical names. So anybody that is on this list that really is only on there because they're poetic published publications, I'm going to go ahead and cross them out now. No need for Edmund Spencer. No need for Gabriel Harvey. Uh, John Lilly's definitely a playwright. We'll keep him on here for now. Uh, Gosson's also a playwright. Uh, not for long. He's more of a satirist. Uh, gets into the church and uh, university or something. Uh, Peel's totally a playwright. Okay. Abraham France, only a poet. Henry Cospel, only a poet. Samuel Daniel does do plays, as you saw in our uh, video last time, but none of them are commercial public plays. They're all sort of private closets, uh, you know, aristocratic, small venue settings. Um, of course, we know Marlowe, Drayton, Chettle, Shakespeare. Uh, Nash is a poet um, and mostly a pamphleteer, um, but he is supposed to have written plays, so I'll keep him up for now, but we'll go back to him. Thomas Campion, totally just a poet. Let's, let's not even have him on here. Uh, Richard Barnfield, totally just a poet. The rest of these guys, uh, we'll talk about them a lot. And then uh, these guys are all playwrights, so we'll keep them on here. Okay, so we've narrowed down our list to only playwrights for this discussion. What I wanted to show is that anybody with this sort of lighter square behind their name, like Chapman or Wilson or Monday here, um, you'll see it matches this color rectangle here. Uh, this is to show that these are names specifically in the Henslow Diary. So not just one of their plays got referenced, but their name is in there specifically in a contract where they're getting paid directly by Philip Henslow or directly by a secretary of Philip Henslow to produce a book, AKA a script of dialogue for a play. Um, and so every one of these names is what I would call a Henslow name or a Henslow writer. Um, Let's look at anybody that's not a Henslow writer for a second. Okay, uh, George Gaskin, he's dead before Henslow comes around, so uh, no need for him. Uh, John Lilly is big time, big time playwright in the 80s, but he's supposed to have long retired and he's working for the crown and uh, he's just kind of doing small you know, anonymous stuff. He's, he's not a playwright by the 90s, so um, we'll cross him off. Uh, Stephen Gosson, very similarly, wrote in the 70s and 80s, but he's not a playwright later on. Um, George Peel totally is, and he's maybe our uh, sort of wild card here, and we'll come back to that. Um, Robert Greene dies in 1592, so even though Robert Greene, you'll see this list, this little square with the asterisk. I put that there to show that his name isn't actually directly referenced in the Henslow Diary, but the titles of his plays totally are. And so people will say that Robert Greene wrote for Henslow. That may be a leap in logic for me. Um, I don't necessarily know that that's the case. I just know that Henslow showed plays that we have attributed to Robert Greene. Um, and so... Uh, but that said, Robert Greene, he's dead by 1592, so he's pretty much gone for most of the Henslow anyway, so we're not really going to worry about him. Uh, Thomas Kidd, kind of the same thing. He's dead pretty early on. We're not going to worry about him. Both these guys are dead too early to be 
listed in the contracts because the contract section of the Henslow Diary does not start till 1597. So anybody that's dead before 1597, we're going to cross them off the list. Um, Chris Marlowe, his plays are all over the Henslow Diary, but his name is not. Uh, and he is dead by 1593 before any of the contracts are listed. So we're going to cross them off. Shakespeare's not dead. Okay, so he should totally be in the Henslow Diary, right? He's not. There's no, there's no William Shakespeare name. Totally have some of his plays listed. Um, and we'll get into that discussion. That's the basis of our discussion tonight. Uh, but he is not listed. I'm not going to cross him out because that's what we're searching for with Shakespeare. Uh, so let's move onwards. Thomas Nash. Uh, Thomas Nash is not directly listed. Um, but and neither are any of his plays because we don't know that he directly wrote a play. We know that he may, or we think that he may have helped Christopher Marlowe or helped Ben Johnson write some plays, but uh, we don't know that for a fact. Um, that said, his name actually is in the Henslow Diary, but that is supposed to be a forgery by a man named John Payne Collier, who is a 1800 scholar. And John Payne Collier, to me, is one of the worst guys ever because it calls into question so much of this document. Um, but the transcript that we will look at will point out what is a forgery and what is not. But uh, Thomas Nash's name is included in the diary, but it is John Payne Collier's. Does uh, he die forgery. before? 57 or uh, 97 he is pretty much unaccounted for after the year 1597 okay so he's uh uh supposed to have died around 1600 nobody really knows for sure uh he supposedly just evaded jail for isle of the dogs and nobody ever saw him again um which is why if y'all have watched any of my earlier or our earlier videos we use the name Thomas Decker and Thomas Nash almost interchangeably. I don't think we've actually revealed that yet. No. Um, we, we haven't fully explained that. Uh, I'm stealing that a little bit from Stephanie Hopkins Hughes, although um, I think there's way more to it than just the stuff that I've read from her, but that sort of set me on the idea. I'm sorry, not Stephanie Hopkins Hughes. I'm totally misquoting. Donna Price. Um, uh, Donna Price, uh, big time Marlowe. She's uh, one of the ones that... Uh, uh, really opened that idea for me and showed me that Marlowe's probably not just one writer. It's probably Marlowe and Decker, according to her, or Marlowe and Nash, according to her. And she shows that Decker and Nash are probably the same guy. Uh, I'm very, very uh, big fan of that idea. And uh, we'll have another video later that goes into the whole Decker Nash phenomenon and just exactly what Thomas Decker's relationship is to the Shakespeare canon. Um, but for now, I'm going to say that uh, there's no use for Thomas Nash. Like, we have the stuff, we have the plays that he wrote listed. Uh, they're very few and far between. But definitely follows the trend of, like, yeah, dead or uh, MIA too still. Right, right. Uh, right. If like, he's not yet in this thing. Uh, and then so we get to that. And all we have is John Fletcher, Philip Massinger, Francis Beaumont, William Rowley, John Ford, Cyril Turner, Nathan Field. All these guys are too, too uh, young or haven't become playwrights yet. Uh, so, you know, maybe Beaumont and Fletcher are old enough, but they don't b uh, burst on the scene until after this diary. Um, and the, same, the, the rest of these guys are all just too young. And so uh, what we have here is a list of the only Elizabethan writers of the Henslow era. Um, what you'll notice is every single one of them, I'm not joking, every single one of them write for Henslow except William Shakespeare. What's going on here? What's happening? Um, let's, let's, let's look into this further. Um, so if we go over here and we look at a list of the Lord Chamberlain's men who wrote for the Lord Chamberlain's men as opposed to all these other guys that you're seeing. These guys all wrote for the Lord Admiral's men. Uh, so who wrote for the Lord Chamberlain's men? Uh, Wikipedia or Big Time Scholars. Uh, they all give you the same names and it's a very short list. And once again, Beaumont and Fletcher are still too young to be concurrent 
with the names and dates that we're working with here, like, yeah, they'd be around with these guys later in the 1600s, but uh, 1597, 98, 99, 1600, 1601, those guys are not writing yet. So who is writing for the Lord Chamberlain's men? Like, if this one group that is supposed to be second fiddle to this other group, you know, this is the second fiddle, this is the first place big dogs, um, if this group has 20-something writers, surely this one has more than three. But no, these are the names that you get. These are the names that you get. And wait Which a second. Yeah, Thomas yeah. Decker, Ben Johnson, William Shakespeare. Wait a second. We already have these guys over here. And uh, by the way, uh, Thomas Decker more so than Ben Johnson, but even Ben Johnson, they're both doing a lot of work for Henslow. Thomas Decker is like the main writer for Henslow. Uh as much as you can have a main writer in this group, he is. Um, so they're probably not doing that much work for the Chamberlain's men. Who is? Well, they'll tell you, and I'm going to quote Wikipedia, Shakespeare's work undoubtedly formed the great bulk of the company's repertory. That's what they tell you, you know, according to Wikipedia. And, um, I should have checked the citation on who, who's putting that quote on there. But I want to ask how, how in the world? How in the world is he the bulk of the repertory? Because the same... A little more. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. You're good. Uh, the same exact Stratfordians will tell you that... And, you know, this you, you can just count. Shakespeare only writes about two plays a year at most. Sometimes it's only one play a year. So how can an entire company that is supposed to be the biggest company in the English-speaking world, how can they possibly function only producing two new plays a year. Uh, and even if it's only two new plays and they're running a bunch of old plays, what old plays are they running? Because at the time that the Lord Chamberlain's men reforms in 1594, um, while they're still working with Hensel, albeit, um, only five to seven of Shakespeare's titles that you know we consider part of the folio and part of Shakespeare, only five to seven are even around. So it's like, if they're thinking that they have a big enough store of plays to go uh, start doing their own thing and not have to share with the Henslow group, um, I, what other plays? Like, Are they just repeating the same five to seven until Shakespeare writes a new one? And here's the thing. They can't do that because almost all of these are already Henslow Diary plays. We're going to see that Henry VI... Um, King Lear. King Lear, Hamlet, uh, Titus, Titus Andronicus. Right. All those titles are already included in the early 1590s in Henslow Diary. Um, now, what some Stratfordians will tell you about that is they'll tell you that Hamlet and King Lear are actually, you know, Shakespeare's versions are actually reworks of originals by Thomas Kidd. And they'll call, you know, the original Hamlet the Ur Hamlet. And uh, some people won't say that it's by Thomas Kidd. They'll just weakly say that other people say it's by Thomas Kidd. Um, but the point being that they like to say that it's Kidd because there's no way that Shakespeare's already writing some of his best stuff that early on, right? He's supposed to be this nobody that's picking up tricks from Marlowe. And, yeah, maybe he's a little bit of a natural. Uh, that said, there will be some Stratfordians that argue that the OG actually is William Shakespeare when he's in the Henslow group. But my point is, is that neither of these people are actually listed in the Henslow group. Just these titles are. And I would like to point out with this whole video and with more videos after this that these titles are probably written by our guys over here probably written by these cats and I'll show you some actual examples that are shown in the contracts of Philip Henslow and so um, Brady and I being group theorists this is a group theorist best friend this document is a group theorist best friend because it shows that not just collaboration but a giant store of writers is necessary to keep a play playhouse running 
And, and, uh, and that the, the best plays are there don't just like all of a sudden explode on the scene and say, oh, look, here's Shakespeare with all the best stuff. It's like, no, a lot of these titles have been reworked. Reworked and, and yeah. reworked and reworked. And yeah, at best, even if people can try to somehow claim that Shakespeare is just reworking that stuff, it's like, well, then, you know, you, you have to sort of like detract a lot of that, uh, you know, original thought that's, you know, attributed to him and, you know, start to pay homage to, uh, homage to some of these other guys that seem to be kind of, you know, uh, coming up with a lot of the bare bones for, you know, the best stuff ever, right? So, right. Um, yeah, if yeah. anything, it still diminishes the main Stratford, uh, yeah, visage or whatever, you know? Yeah, this idea of the lone genius, uh, like, people will quote Ben Johnson sincerely when Ben Johnson says that Shakespeare didn't have to blot out a line. Um, and it's like, well, no, that's so obviously the opposite of the case, and people need to realize that's how you have to read Ben Johnson. Um Okay, uh, real quick, I wanted to just show in comparison uh, one of the famous other documents, the other artifact that I think is so uber important and will be a key for us, especially in tandem with the Henslow Diary, is the Book of Sir Thomas More. It's a manuscript for a play that may or may not have actually gotten performed. Uh, we don't have the printed copy. We have the actual manuscript copy, which is extremely rare. Like the Henslow Diary, it's this extremely rare glimpse into the era. And both these documents independently show that collaboration is the norm. And so, uh, I think for the longest time, Shakespeare has been so dominant in the literature that we've considered him as the norm. And so, Shakespeare and Marlowe and Johnson, they're all these lone geniuses that don't need to work with people, but... As you know, people look into the Henslow Diary, as Sir Thomas More gets more and more eyes on it, um, I think people will start to understand that that's totally not the norm. And I think that the Stratfordians have already been put up against that, and they've started to concede that uh, there is collaboration in the folio, uh, albeit they're very picky and choosy about what is collaboration, and they pretty much only pawn off the crap. Uh, and they say, oh, that, that stuff's not good. That must be some other guy like Fletcher or Middleton. Uh, but at least they're open to the idea that Shakespeare, Folio, the canon is not totally even. Um, I don't think that they look quite deep enough to realize it's much more uneven than they think. Um, but let us continue further. Uh, one thing I also want to point out, it's not just that it, this is the norm. Let's count how many people are in this as a writer. One, two, three four, five, six. Six writers for one play. Meanwhile, what we're told is the paradigm, what we're told is the dominant force has three writers for an entire company. That's ridiculous. I don't, I don't know how that sort of disparity can be resolved by strat 40 and explanation alone like that's it's impossible right like that's crazy um and so we have two documents that show that collaboration is the norm group effort is the norm let's let's probably take that at face value um okay so onwards we're not going to look too much into sir thomas more today but we are going to dive real quick into the henslow diary so you can get a little taste for yourself so that you don't have to Go do too much digging. Uh, I can help you get started. Uh, so I'm going to scroll to page 13 because that's where stuff really gets started. Uh, any stuff that I scroll through, um, like those, those first 12 pages, th that's just like miscellaneous like payments for like gowns and stage stuff or like daily groceries for him or like little notes. Uh, there's just a few places in this diary where he has like little you know, sort of medieval renaissance era, like, pastime games that you can do, like, when you're bored. We'd say, like, when you're taking a trip in the car, of course, they didn't have that. Uh, but, like, little weird things like that are little psychological puzzles. So this document's not, like, 100% devoted to the theater. It's, it's kind of a wacky mix of stuff. Like, this is Henslow's diary. Um, so what we have here is a list. Um, I don't have my pen anymore, but I will highlight stuff. It says... 1591 um, so we're pretty early on here um, we're still when all those guys that were supposed to be dead are still alive um, 
and it says that all these are being played by Lord Strange's men, which uh, Lord Strange is yet another guy. <laughs> another rabbit hole. Another guy that dies uh, in this time. He dies in 1594 of strange, you know, mysterious circumstances. And um, one day I would like to solve that, but uh, that's that's for later. Uh, so if we start looking at it, we got we got plays like Friar Bacon. That's supposed to be a um, a Robert Greene play. We got Orlando. That's another Robert Greene play. Uh, we got a bunch of sort of histories. Harry of Cornwall. Oh, here we go. Jewel of Mal uh, Maltus. <laughs> hmm. You'll notice uh, the spelling is very haphazard, very loosey goosey. Um, but yeah, the Jew of Malta. That's that's. Uh, Marlowe. Marlowe. And uh, you'll notice over here in the left we have a blank space, but down a little bit lower we got this N-E. This N-E means new. So when we don't see an N-E, we assume that means that wasn't new. So Jew of Malta, not new. Uh, but I also want to point something else out. Over here, these Roman numerals, that's how much money it made. And so if you're decent at Roman numerals and also know how much, you know, English money is worth, uh, you can kind of see the value. And so here we got 10 plus 5 plus <coughs> 1 plus 1, 17 sterling. Uh, so fire bacon, not that much. Uh, but let's scroll down. Next one, uh, 10 plus 10 plus 9, that's 29. Okay. Uh, Malamarco, not sure what that is. That made a little more. Uh, but let's find a really successful one. Okay, here we go. Uh, 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 2. Harry of Cornwall. Histories are big back then. But then look at the next one. L. What is L? That's 50. That's the big bucks. What is making the big bucks? Boom. Jew of Malta. Mm. Scroll down. Keep going. See where the next one with the big bucks is? We got an LV1. That's a 56. What is it? Oh, it's the Jew of Malta. So uh, this is really cool. It's fun. You get to see like... And I guess that is the best comparison for like Rod's Tomatoes is what we can get. I mean, because Jew of Malta, because yeah, I'm not the biggest uh, playwright consumer, but I have read Jew of Malta and that is a fun play to read. Like it yeah. is actually like quite enjoyable. There's a lot of like good little zingers in there and like the cool flex of like, you know, vocabulary and just, yeah, the whole setup and whatnot. It's and fun. also like for any of you folks that have read Shakespeare and haven't read Marlowe, go read Marlowe. Marlowe's awesome. Uh, it's almost, it's, you know, on one hand it's sad, but on the other hand, it's kind of cool that it's condensed. Uh, Marlowe plays may have been heavily censored. Um, they're much shorter than the Shakespeare plays. It may be that plays hadn't developed to the length they have, but uh, surely some of his plays were heavily censored. But because of that, they're quick and breezy. Like, they're not these, you know, 100-page things. You can... Uh, Massacre at Paris is like 35 pages. Like, And that one is a little uh, hollow, I'll be honest. But, uh, um, yeah, go check out Marlowe if you have it. Uh, and if you have, um, you know, I'm preaching the choir. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, but moving onwards, like, okay, these are all cool, but whoa, new. What's this new one? What the heck? What is it? Harry. Harry's another name for Henry. That's, that's, it's used interchangeably. So anytime you see Harry, like Harry of Cornwall, that's Henry of Cornwall. Uh, probably some famous duke or prince or something. Um, but here we have Henry the Sixth. Now, wait a second. That's a Shakespeare title, isn't it? Yes, that is... Shakespeare title, and Stratfordians will tell you, yes, that's because that is Shakespeare's play, the one that he wrote. Maybe he had a little help from Marlowe or Kidd, just maybe. But he pretty much wrote it, and he wrote it while working for Henslow. That's what they will tell you. It's not what we'll tell you. It's not what we're saying. Uh, what we're saying is that this is a collection of plays that are being written by a stable of writers, and pen names are being placed to them. And um, which people in the stable of writers kind of make the combo that make the play, I think that's the interesting discussion that's needing to be had. Um, so let's continue onwards and get the heck out of 1591, uh, move on to 1592. A lot of this, oh, sorry guys. Um, oh, we're all the way to 1595. Um, oh, sorry. Huh, I went backwards. Okay, I'll get this. Brady will edit this out and post that. <laughs> okay. So we get it 1592. My bad. 
Okay, so there's other titles on here that we've been seeing. Geronimo. What is Geronimo? Geronimo is either the Spanish tragedy or the lost prequel or lost sequel to the Spanish tragedy because one of the main characters and key moving figures of Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy is Geronimo. So we have Kidd in here. We've got Marlowe in here. We've got Green in here. We've got Shakespeare in here. Um, but do we have them or do we just have titles that we attribute to them? Um, you know, are they even real people? Uh, okay, so we move on. Uh, we start to get some famous anonymous plays like A Knack to Know a Knave. Uh, sometimes Wait, what is the name? Uh, Knack to Know a Knave. Oh, that's a cool title. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, clearly a comedy. That, uh, any title like that, you know, any of those all's well that end well, little kind of fun little quips. Uh, those are always comedies, by the way. Uh, so Knack to Know a Knave is a comedy. Uh, we do have prints of that, but we don't know who wrote it. People suggest Ben Johnson, but he's kind of young at this point. People suggest Decker, but... A lot of people don't like that because they don't. A lot of people want to say Decker doesn't start writing until later. So some people say Thomas Nash. Some people say Thomas Lodge and Thomas Nash. Some people say Robert Greene. Um, they don't know. And I would like to say they don't know because it may be a combination of what they say those people are. Like the main writer in Robert Greene is prominent in An Act to Know a Knave. The, na the main writer in Ben Johnson is prominent in An Act to Know a Knave. Uh, maybe that, you know, Robert Greene is some other guy like Ben Johnson or Henry Chettle or something like that. And we'll get into that later. Uh, maybe not in this video. Um, so it's not just Shakespeare titles or big name playwright titles. It's also like, there's just, you know, sort of important plays in here that we do still have copies of that are sort of well regarded. Um, and so we get onwards into 1593 and we get to a new list. Um, we get the Earl of Sussex's men. So, Hinslow is no longer contracting out with Lord Strange. Uh, maybe at this point Lord Strange went on tour. Maybe at this point Lord Strange's men is disbanding and forming other stuff. Um, but, like, or maybe it's just that, like, Hinslow sort of has a deal since he's got the only kind of theater in, uh, he doesn't have the only theater in town, but he's got the biggest, best theater in town that like maybe they're gonna rotate through, and so you you get this this section, you get this this section, kind of like uh, the way the uh, the uh, big time media networks do with like the the Super Bowl or the World Cup or the Olympics. Like they'll you know sometimes rotate it or uh, they'll make deals to where okay Fox gets it for a few years and then it'll rotate to NBC, but then NBC has to rotate the Wimbledon to some other co uh, company. Uh, it could be something like that. Um, so let's move on further. Uh, a lot of these titles are like, uh, I don't know that title. Um, like, Hewan of Burdock. Who can forget classic play, Hewan of Burdock? Do you see any ones that have made a lot of money that we don't know any title names for or anything just right off the bat? And so I'm glad you brought that up. I'm so glad you brought that up because uh, let's look at the numbers. Uh, good speed the plow, uh, <laughs> hit hit play. Good speed the plow made all of uh, uh, three. <laughs> uh, and actually, no, this is three L and one sterling. So this may have made a lot of money, but I don't. I don't I'm not entirely sure what L is. Maybe that's uh, um, the pounds or something. Uh, I need to familiarize myself with this more. But uh, let's look through and look at just the straight sterlings. Okay, here we go. Uh, Buckingham made, oh, 51. Okay, Buckingham, that's a big one. Who is Buckingham? Uh, who, what was Buckingham in? Buckingham's a character in Richard III. Interesting. Uh. Okay, well, what's the next title? Richard the Confessor. Uh. And that also seems to made a pretty big amount of money. Perhaps Richard the Confessor is Richard the Third? I don't know. Uh, there will be several titles in here that, like, wait, maybe that's Richard Third. No, maybe that's Richard Third. But here's the other thing. Um, less in this section and more in the contract section. Uh, Hinslow's not just fast and loose with the spelling, but he's fast and loose with titles. And so he will refer to the same play in three or four different titles. Uh, for instance, um, Chettle and Decker are writing a play in 1599, which is called Troilus and Cressida, 
for uh, you Shakespeare folks that are familiar with the folio. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the same Troilus and Cressida. We'll go into that another day. Uh, but the point being that uh, earlier in the diary, uh, maybe a few entries earlier when they're first writing the play, uh, it's not called Troilus and Cressida yet. It's called uh, the Tragedy of Agamemnon. Uh, but Agamemnon is a prominent character in Troilus and Cressida because it's you know about the fall of Troy, the Trojan War, and all that. Um, and so maybe that's what's happening here, but I doubt it since he's got Richard the Confessor, Buckingham, then he's got Buckingham, then he's got Richard the Confessor. Um, but maybe, I don't know, maybe they work in, in complement to each other or something. Who knows? Um, but just showing that those are some of the big titles. Um, there's other interesting titles. Like, we know... You know, Shakespeare plays are famous for Roman stuff. Uh, you know, they, they hearken to Greek stuff. You know, they'll talk about the Bible, but tell me one famous, like, straight biblical play. And, you know, there's David and Bathsheba, uh, but that's that's not Shakespeare. Um, but, you know, there we'll see more in these lists, like Abraham and Lot. Um, you know, mm. those are interesting. Um we, we don't always get that sort of view. We always like to think of the Renaissance as these almost proto-atheists. But, you know, religion is still a huge deal. Um, okay, here we go. Before I scroll to the next page, this one's a big deal. N.E. Check out that name. Titus and Andronicus. Um, yeah. That's, that's our Titus. That's the Titus you've read. The one that people, even Stratfordians, argue if that's Shakespeare or not because they think it's too silly and too violent. Um... You know, I think our group theory might have an explanation for why that reads like that. Probably not the exact same cast of characters that's writing Julius Caesar. Um, it's probably closer to the cast of characters that is writing Massacre at Paris. It totally reads like that, um, right? And, you know, uh, any of you Marlovians out there, you're like, yeah, duh. Uh, you know, totally rightly so. Um, okay, let me move on from that. Um, and... Before I scroll to more of this, let me go back to my little slides here. So I want to point out another quote that is kind of sums up how mixed up Stratfordians are. Uh, this is another quote from Wikipedia. Performances of works with titles similar to Shakespearean plays, such as uh, Hamlet, Henry the Sixth, uh, Henry the Fifth, Tame of the Shrew, Titus Andronicus, they're mentioned in the Henslow Diary with no author listed. But most of oh these God. plays were recorded when the Admiral's men and Lord Chamberlain's men briefly joined forces when the playoffs were closed owing to the plague. Well, so they're saying this was happening 94, maybe even 93. Uh, no, guys, what the heck are you talking about, Wikipedia? We haven't even got... We just got to 94. We just got there. They were already playing those plays with Sussex's men, with Strange's men. This isn't just like a new Chamberlain men thing and so like what are they talking about they're lying to you my bad uh brady what you got i'm oh, sorry random tangent because you know going off of philip sydney's episode our last episode if you haven't watched that one definitely go check that one out but uh yeah because you kept you kept saying massacre at paris and i was like wait does that have to do with the saint bartholomew's massacre uh or yeah saint bartholomew's day's massacre because i'd watched something about sydney and apparently he was there at that uh, event or whatever, so apparently people will say it played a big part in his life, so that I just now put the two and two together, so I didn't see that. Absolutely, and um, for, I don't know if any of you folks and are he's out... Dead by, then, by now, so... Right, right. Philip said he's supposed to be dead by now, um, although if you watched our video, you'll know that he could be under the guise of Samuel Daniel, and he could be using a pen name to be one of these Henslow writers. Um, but... The um, St. Bartholomew Day's Massacre, uh, that's it's an event in France that happens where uh, all these Huguenots go out and kill the Catholics? Do I, or do I have it backwards? Uh, uh, maybe maybe Hugu the other way around. I think the Catholics or, killed... Um, uh, yeah, uh, or maybe Huguenots are... Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, uh, against the Huguenots. Okay, okay. Yeah. So the Catholics are out there just massacring Huguenots. Yeah, right? yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, of course, you know, Philip Sidney's Mr... Uh, supposed to be Mr. Protestant hero kind of uh, icon. Um, but what I wanted to point out is that uh, it worked really well for Philip Sidney, but that's something that many uh, sort of followings of the Shakespeare authorship question like to point to is that, like, look, Strat Stratford has no knowledge of France. He has no knowledge of the Medicis. 
Uh, Strat Stratford knows nothing of, you know, the French court in the 70s. He knows nothing of the three Henrys of the Wars of the Henrys. Uh, he knows nothing of that bloodshed. Uh, he, he should have been a, a teenager getting drunk by the river in Stratford. Like, no. Um, that That's... But, um, Henry Neville is supposed to have spent time over in the French court. Of course we know Francis Bacon and his brother spent, spent time over in the French court. William Stanley had a very extended stay over in the French court. Um, De Vere, um, I, while I'm not sure if he goes directly to the French court, he has liaisons and he goes on a tour through France and he knows very well of the Medicis uh, and like he would know all this stuff too. Um, so like it's one of the ways that people like to sort of be elitist about Shakespeare authorship and say, no, it's got to be an aristocrat, but it kind of makes sense. Like you, you can't just have like known what happened back then or looked up some, some old article about it. Like it, it, it shows like kind of internal knowledge. And, um, so yeah, uh, I'll, I'll reel away from, uh, the massacre at Paris, but the point being that it's one of the many plays that we can go into this diary in and say like hey let's go look in that and see if we can get any info about Shakespeare authorship and like yeah that's supposed to be a Marlowe play like why are we even talking about Massacre at Paris but like as soon as you connect Marlowe and Shakespeare as being sort of one and the same on this Marlowe and Shakespearean uh, timeline or spectrum um, and or if you go with our sort of group theory thing that like no this is all just one big group um, it all starts to make sense, and it all starts to be relevant. Um, so, yeah, here we go. Massacre, showing June 94. Um, we got Galeas, so that's a new one, not not as famous. Taming of the Shrew, there we go. Um, but, once again, notice, none of... Oh, shoot. Yep, yep. None of these Shakespeare names that they're saying are being played by the Lord Chamberlain's men. None of these are listed as new. Um, Belladon is, but that's, that's not a famous Shakespeare play. Galeasso is, that's not a famous Shakespeare play. Hamlet's totally a famous Shakespeare play. Not new. Uh, Andronicus, not new. Taming of a Shrew, not new. So, um, yeah, something fishy's going on. All right, let's see if I can scroll correctly here. Okay, yep, we're still going through, and we still got some new ones. Uh, Godfrey of Bullen. Tassel's Melancholy, yeah, not some famous ones. This is maybe not the height of theater. Uh, 1593, 94, 95, like, you know, we got some good stuff coming out, but we also, like, they're really pumping it out now. You can tell, like, there's... It's like Saturday Night Live, like, yeah, every, every week you got, you know, new player, you got, obviously, come see some of the, the ones that are obviously popular you now that... Right, right, like, look, August 25th, new play... September 17th, less than a month later, new play. Uh, a week later, exactly, new play. Um, yeah, so yeah, back to your argument about how could Lord Chamberlain's men, right, have only five or three dudes at that working time period. Uh, yeah, how would they be able to survive producing, you know, or unless those dudes are somehow, yeah, like, are just churning them out, but yeah, that doesn't really add up to... Right, or else Chamberlain's using a whole lot more playwrights than we give them credit for, and yeah. if so, that still isolates Shakespeare as this weird guy that he's the only one that doesn't work for both groups. Um, why is that? Why is he exclusive? Uh, well, I think he's exclusive so that we don't have to explain his absence in the Henslow Diary. Um, but, okay, let's see. Caesar and Pompey... Um, Maybe that's our Julius Caesar. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's just related. But whoever's writing this is going to have to have done some research and have plenty of, you know, material about Caesar. It's like a prequel, I guess. Yeah. Right? Uh, totally a prequel. Absolutely. Because I'm uh, pretty sure Pompey's dead by Julius Caesar. Yeah. Um, let's see. You know, we got a, a Knack sequel, the Knack to know a nonist. Um uh, we got Tamberlin still playing. Tamberlin still making some big bucks. Dr. Faustus, shout out, making pretty big bucks. Um, let's see. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Let me move on. Okay, we're moving into 1594. Moving into 1594 still. Okay, and then 
Uh, fun fact, they changed their years not at January. They changed their years in the middle of March, so, you know, Ides of March sort of thing. Um, and so you'll notice it's 1594 up through March, then so we get to April, it's 1595. And we're now into 1595. At this point, Shakespeare's supposed to be off writing, like, you know, Romeo and Juliet and Richard the the Second and stuff like that. Um, he's, and, you know, meanwhile, Henslow and his guys are just pumping, pumping, pumping plays. Maybe one of these plays will be good. <laughs> Maybe one of these plays will be remembered forever. <laughs> and, uh, you know, of course all those Marlowe plays get remembered, but... Yeah, none of them. But legends never die. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, we're still in 1595, and we're getting some new stuff. Uh, part two of Hercules. I wish that was still around. Yeah. All so many of these plays are not still in uh, around. You can't read them; they're lost. And some of these sound pretty freaking awesome. I'll be honest. Um, just by the title alone. Uh, let's see here. Here we go. June 95. Part two of Caesar. Wait, didn't didn't Brady just say Caesar and Pompey felt like a prequel? That's probably part one because we haven't come across something that just says part one of Caesar yet. Uh, so that's probably part one. Our sequel here is Julius Caesar. This is our downfall of Caesar. So part one is the rise. That kind of sounds like part two is the fall. Being like, oh yeah, Julius Caesar part two. Cause yeah. Apparently they told me it's not the same thing they just did. <laughs> and and I mean, if you think that's crazy that I'm saying some other place, Caesar and Pompey is the first, and part two is our Shakespeare, Julius Caesar. Like, Remember, how is Tamburlaine structured? Tamburlaine, which is maybe the most successful play leading up into the early 90s, is structured where the first part is all about the rise of the super powerful char character, and the second part is about his you know, tragic Greek-style downfall. Um, like, isn't that exactly what Julius Caesar is, is the downfall? And wouldn't Caesar and Pompey be about the rise of Caesar over Pompey? Like, oh, well, wait a second. Hold on. Let me, uh, uh, let me scroll a little further. Here we go. Part one of Caesar, part two of Caesar. Here we go, guys. Right here. Right here. So there it is. Like, we already have our Julius Caesar. Okay. Uh, we don't get to know who writes it. But here's what's interesting is that we are now in the parts of Shakespeare's supposed career where He's not with Henslow anymore. So, you know, I scroll a page earlier and I show you Henry VI or something like that. They'll tell you, look, yeah, Shakespeare's still writing with with Chamberlain, uh, with uh, Henslow. But now that we're in 1595, he's supposed to be gone. They'll just tell you, no, this isn't related to his plays. Totally not his plays. And it's like, well, guys, uh, I'm pretty sure that, like, those other titles that we shot, thought were Shakespeare plays were Shakespeare plays. Why wouldn't these be? Um, let's continue, because we're going to get to some juicier stuff that sort of explains this. Um, let me scroll past some of, this, some of these box office things. Some of these are pretty awesome. Okay, here we go. Yet another version of that. 1595, Henry V. Um, so, wait a second. Isn't that Shakespeare? What the heck? What's going on? So this one, they will tell you, yeah, that is Shakespeare. That's a Shakespeare play, and for whatever reason, it's being shown with Henslow's guys. Maybe it's that the Chamberlain's men are still co-playing. Not entirely sure. Um, what's, what's going on here? Um, let me see. Let's go back to the top here. Who are these plays for? Is this all still... Okay, so here we go. It's for the Lord Admiral's men and Lord Chamberlain's men. Wait, what the heck? So they're sharing. Um, my whole thing is, is like, if they're sharing here, why wouldn't they continue to share? Like, what what is so exclusive and so competitive about these groups? Like, why couldn't all these rotating aristocratic patronage guys who are all buddies with each other, like, why would their you know, patronage groups be so at odds with each other? Why would they be so exclusive and competitive? Yeah, I get it. It's a business. But, um, you know, as a whole, they're still working together, much like our big media is today. Like, it's like, a, yeah, yeah, it's a business. It's like saying, like, yeah, the MLB is going to compete with 
what other Major League Baseball franchise in America. Right. Are like, yeah, it's like, nah, it's like, yeah, you know, obviously all of the owners are, you know, it's, it's like, yeah, sure, they're competing against each other. It's but totally monopolized. It's the MLB. Yeah, You're absolutely sure. right. It's totally monopolized by aristocratic people that get the right from the queen to do it. Like, no, this, this isn't some big competitive open thing. And, like, even if you want to say it's a competitive open thing, there are cases in our modern society where competitive open people make a deal with each other. Like, uh, for instance, I don't know if it's still the case, but for like the last decade or two, Netflix has had a contract so that like the big five media companies all have equal part shares to a sub share of Netflix so that they can all put their stuff on Netflix and not have to compete with it. Um, you know, at some point, maybe that has changed and now Netflix has to compete with them. But that's what I'm saying here is that maybe at some point this does become a competitive thing. I don't know that that's fully formalized by 1595 or even by 1600 something, you know. Um, so let's look farther into this. Um, still having a lot of the same plays popping up. Caesar and Pompey, Tamberland, Jew of Malta, Dr. Faustus. Um Nectano Nave or Nectano Nonest. Um, and, and also to ask, uh, answer your question earlier about saying, well, can they, are they just going to reshow, you know, the same old plays? I guess you could argue, like, yes, because Jew of Malta was being shown like two years ago, yep. and it's still being shown again now. Still. Uh, and one, I think that's still attestation, or attestation to how good Marlowe is, because look at the staying power of all right. this stuff and why, obviously, people will be like, will argue, uh, you know, maybe there's some connection between him and Shakespeare. Uh, but yeah, if, if all this stuff's being shown all the time, how can we have receipts for, like, you know, these much lower guys, but nothing, of course, with Shakespeare's name officially on it, you know? Absolutely. And uh, what I also want to point out is interesting is that, like, uh, you're starting to see, like, inflation happen. Like, we're getting bigger numbers. It's not necessarily because it's a more successful play. We're just getting, you know, more sales happening at the plays. Maybe actual monetary inflation. Um, but it's like, you know, for play names like, like here we go at the French Comedy that made fifty, fifty sterling. That was like our biggest number earlier. Um, and it, this is a new play debuting to big numbers. That's not always the case. Um, the French Comedy could very well be a Shakespeare title. Uh, one of his. Uh, French comedies like uh, All's Well That Ends Well or um, Measure for Measure or something like that. Uh, I think All's Well would probably date better. Uh, let's see. Yeah, still getting a lot of the same titles. We keep going. Uh, let me go further past all the box office stuff because we're seeing a lot of interesting stuff here. But the second part is even better than this. Like, this is fun. This is great. This is really cool stuff. Um... Yeah, still seeing Henry V, Henry V, Henry V. So that one is pretty dang popular. Popular enough to where it can show like once a week and make big money. Uh, and that's still a super popular one, especially in England. Um, so yeah, just showing some of the staying power there. All right, let me go ahead and scroll all the way to page 57 so I can get to the juicy stuff. Received of Mr. Henslow... Uh, in earnest of the tragedy of some 20 sterling the 27th of November William Houghton JD um, so what that is is that is authors signing that they got paid for writing a script and our authors are William Houghton and JD's probably John Day and we'll get a confirmation of that later in this because we'll see another entry for that play uh, once again, this is out of chronological order. It's the first contract that we see in it. It's 1599, but actually uh, the, the contract started at 1597 and work up through and past 1599. Um, but I just wanted to point this out because it's the first one you'll get to if you read through the diary, like start to finish. Um, and so it gives us how much they're paid. It'll give us the date and the title. Um, and so here we go. Here's the next one. Henry Chettle, November 7, 27, 1599, a book called The Orphan's Tragedy. Um, that's one that some, you know, more fringe group theorists have speculated. That could be Hamlet, or the bare bones of what Hamlet is. is uh, Hamlet is technically an orphan after his father dies. Um, but one reason people maybe speculate that is that it 
this is a play that gets worked over a lot in this diary, and we'll see that Orphan's Tragedy is still getting worked over and getting sequelized years after this, 1601. Um, that said, we've already seen Hamlet in here, so why wouldn't they just call it Hamlet? But you'll see that like there's stuff in here that Hensel will just change the na name on a dime, and he totally means the same thing. Uh, so here we go, some more Henry Chettle. Uh, we'll also see some stuff where he's just lending money to people to buy stuff or get stuff. Not as interested in that. We're pretty much interested in the main writer stuff. So let me see. Uh, yeah, he's lending Her Hen Henry Porter, who's one of his playwrights, some money. Um, here we go. Um, Thomas Decker and William Houghton, the sum of 20 shillings, and part payment for the Book of Truth, Supplication of Candlelight. Uh, don't know that play title. That's probably one of Henslow's kind of subtitles. That's probably not the actual name that we would know the play by. Not sure what that play is. Um, all right. Now that you sort of get how to look at that, let me scroll to some more interesting stuff. Lent under Henry Chettle uh, at the request of Robert Shaw in earnest of his comedy called Tis No Desert to Deserve the Deserver. Um... Let me see. Okay, here we go. We're in the 1599s. Um, here's one. Lent unto Samuel Rowley and Thomas Downton to buy a book uh, called The Gentle Craft of Thomas Dickers. Thomas Dickers is Thomas Decker. Uh, the Gentle Craft is the Shoemaker's Holiday. Almost certainly it's the Shoemaker's Holiday. Um, that's, that's maybe Thomas Decker's biggest solo play that's still in print now. I don't know that it was the biggest play then. But it's one that, like, if you study Thomas Decker, you'll probably end up reading Shoemaker's Holiday. Um, let me see. Okay, so you see this kind of weird-looking typewritery font? That denotes a forgery by John Payne Collier. So in this we have, Lent unto William Bourne uh, to lend unto Mr. Maxton, the new poet, in earnest of a book called The Sum, blah, blah, blah. Uh, why this passage is frustrating it's not just the forgery like one the forgery is not even necessary uh we already have maxton's name here and maxton is probably henslow's weird way of saying john marston and so i guess collier to sort of solidify that puts Mastone, trying to show another bad henslow spelling but why would henslow spell it wrong twice in the same sentence that's a weird one um but what's frustrating about it is we don't get what the book's called. Almost always we get what the book's called. But look, oh, it's been left blank, supposedly. And uh, people say that he leaves it blank when he doesn't know what the title's going to be called. Uh, but he sure is paying a lot of money for a book he don't know what the title is. I just want to point that out. Um, so I have suspicions that this artifact has been meddled with a little bit. And there's uh, maybe several reasons for that. I'm not going to go into it too much here because... Uh, I don't want to totally undercut the value of this uh, document, but this is a good example of some weirdness. And particularly what's weird about this is this is the only entry with John Marston. Uh, and John Marston does become a big time playwright after this, but we don't see his name throughout Henslow. It's like, eh, he kind of bought one play from this guy. Um, so John Marston's a guy that um, I didn't list on, on that other sheet that Maybe he's one that could be writing for the Chamberlain's Men, but they don't say that. Um, and that's because, no, John Marston's all, uh, pretty much primarily writing for St. Paul's, um, supposedly at least. Uh, let me go further. Just a quick bono, like, what, who benefits from, from this guy forging that stuff anyway in that fashion, you know? It's just, uh, I don't get it. It's a weird one. Um, yeah, it'd make one sense if you really like, try to put your own lineage or your own name into something, but it's just like, nah, I'm going to put like another author in there. It's like, well, why? Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. I don't get, well, like, yeah, you know, I don't know I, much about the Ford. I get when he sticks Thomas Nash in there because he just, you know, wants to see a name like that in here. Like we, but why? Um, to, I don't know, sort of, yeah. Solidify so the way he can go make cool internet theories and then like take credits like look guys look I'm the first guy to see that well, like <laughs> I don't know yes <laughs> you know, yes kind of and like, like I think like the reason that people like us start to lean towards Thomas Nash becomes Thomas Decker and 
isn't, you know, maybe even a real guy, and both those are kind of incognito names. Like, the reason that we think that is because Thomas Nash's life is, like, so poorly documented, and, like, it's either really well documented for, like, certain literary things, but, like, his actual, like, whereabouts and what he does and his motivation, all that's super nebulous. And uh, so I think, like, this is almost him, like, trying to will that into fruition. That Look, look, we got Thomas Nash. We found him. He's there. Um, but, of course, for me, that's, you know, incredibly suspect. I'm not necessarily blaming Collier for being nefarious, but, like, what he's doing is incredibly destructive there. And it can be seen as nefarious uh, because it can make it look like, hey, I know Thomas Nash is bullshit, but I'm going to put it in here. And it's like, well, come on, man. That's, uh, you're just muddying the water. Mm. And so, like, at some point, that may be his role is to muddy the water. You know, like, maybe a lot of uh, Stratfordians. <laughs> yeah, poisoning the well. Yeah. Um, here's one that I found just today when I was looking through it researching. I find this one very fascinating. Lent unto William Harton. William. William is a man's name. Uh, there's never been a point where I was like, William, that must be a chick. William Harton, the uh, 21st of November, in earnest of... What the heck? Her book? Her book? I know that he's fast and loose with spelling and titles, but with gendered pronouns, that's... Like, is this a weird typo? Surely Greg wouldn't make that typo. And surely Henslow wouldn't accidentally write It's like her. two letters you have to screw up. Yeah, you can't write his, it's I-S, and then you have to go to her. It's like completely, yeah, not just one letter off, you know? And, you know, you'll see in here where when he's got multiple writers, he'll say, for their book, and the way he'll spare, spell there is T-H-E-R. So it's like, okay, maybe it's there without the T, but we, we just have one name. That's just one name. Why would they say there? Um, so... Her. Well, I'll be honest with you. Anytime I see her in a playwright situation where we could have a pseudonym, uh, I think Mary Sidney. Okay? Um, that's just where I've been led. She is by far the premier female writer. Um, there's others that come after her. Related to, obviously, yeah, she's, our, our boy over yeah, here. She's, yeah, <laughs> she's Philip's little baby little sister. Uh, she's supposed to be every bit as sharp and smart and good at writing as Philip is. Um, but okay, so I think Mary Sidney, when I see her, well, lent unto William Harton an earnest of her book called, what's the book called? What's the play called? The play's called Mary. What? Okay. Something weird's going on here. I don't have the full decoding of that. I wish I, I did. I wish I could be like, ha ha, like that last Sidney video. Ah, oh, I did the Samuel Daniel letters, and no, oh, it's Philip. No, I don't have that. Um, but what I do have is just a pile of weirdness, um... But let me go further. Uh, let me see. Oh, let me go actually back up. So I think it's on the previous page here. Okay, here we go. Receive uh, by me, Thomas Downton, uh, Philip Hingelow, to pay, <clears throat> to pay Mr. Monday, that's Anthony Monday, Mr. Drayton, Michael Drayton, Mr. Wilson, Robert Wilson, and Hathaway, Richard Hathaway, for the first part of the life of Sir John Oldcastle, and in earnest of the second part for the use of the company, ten pounds, I say receive. Uh, so that's big, big money. Uh, Sir John Old, I'm pretty sure Oldcastle is that not the name of the family that Falstaff is named after? The character Falstaff. Yep. Yeah. So the original Falstaff character, very good. The original Falstaff character is actually named Sir John Oldcastle. And so uh, obviously it's a Henry V character, right? Yeah, um, he, he's and, he's uh, an actual person that's around same time as Henry V or Hen Henry the Fourth. Um, What's the name of this play again? This play is Sir John Oldcastle. Okay, so is it? Um, and so what happens is supposedly this is the narrative, is that uh, the Shakespeare Henry the Fourth plays come out, and uh, the Falstaff character is still named Old, uh, John Oldcastle. And uh, the family of John Oldcastle, who are still kind of prominent figures, they're pissed as hell about the depiction of the Falstaff character. Um, because if you've read any of those plays, Falstaff's a drunken bastard. Dude. He's hilarious. He's awesome. But he's not necessarily this heroic knight. And uh, Sir John Oldcastle, for all, all intents and purposes, maybe was kind of a 
you know, use use another night guy just like anybody else. Like, what what do you got to turn him into this thing for? Um, maybe there's historical family drama there that we could sort of decode with some of these aristocratic families, but we, that's not where we're going with this. Um, the point being that the Henry the Fourth plays that was supposed to be the Chamberlain's men, and they wrote it, and Shakespeare wrote it, and he didn't give a damn about the Old Castle family because he wanted a good character. And because of that, the Old Castles get real pissed. And they want a rewrite, and uh, so they go to, I guess, the rival of the Chamberlain's men to rewrite it. Um, but it seems to me that, like, this is another case where, well, no, I don't know that some other guy's writing it for the Chamberlain's men. It's probably these same guys wrote it, and they put it out with the Chamberlain's men. Uh, the people want a remake, so they're going to put it out with the Admiral's men. But it's still the same guys writing um, and this combination of people together is something we call Shakespeare and perhaps it's not the same exact guys perhaps it's like you know Michael Drayton was in the Henry the fourth play but that one also maybe had Decker and uh, maybe one of these other names like Ben Johnson or something but like with this one they're like no Decker and Johnson don't know how to handle themselves because they constantly got to poke fun at everybody so let's get some of the more serious plot oriented people or let's get some of the, you know, Monday's supposed to be the best plotter. Uh, or let's get, uh, you know, some of the people that know how to really be patriotic, like Michael Drayton. Michael Drayton's super awesome, middle-of-the-road dad genes Shakespeare. Like, he is like the freaking Forrest Gump Shawshank Redemption <laughs> of the 1590s. Gran Torino. <laughs> and, uh, by the way, I, I mentioned in another video that I think that's the guy who DeVere is. Like, if DeVere is one of these names and these names go one-to-one, -one, and like, because uh, Drayton has poetry, not just plays. We can go look at the poetry of Michael Drayton. It's, it's all kind of uber patriotic, not uber patriotic, but like, you know, uh, very middle of the road. Like, you got to learn lessons from patriotism. You got to work hard for it. And, you know, it's something to be proud of. And, uh, you know, there's mystical, romantic aspects to it. But you got to, you know, uh, remember how things go. And it's, you know, simple. And it's not overly wordy or imagistic or anything. So, uh, a lot of people really like Michael Drayton. Uh, this is the only play that you can, and I think it's only like some Michael Bay stuff. Right? Uh, yeah, like uh, not 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 quite that thoughtless. Yeah. <laughs> not quite Michael you see, Bay. Yeah, I think like Ooh, uh, uh, Spielberg. Right? There you go. Spielberg. Okay. Yeah, uh, where it's like yeah, it's middle of the road, but it's thoughtful, um, but maybe not the best in the world. Right. Um, but Sir John Oldcastle is the only play that you can read that we attribute to Michael Drayton. And uh, I think we only have one part of it. I can't remember if it's the first or the second part. Um, so do we glad think that's like its own play? Do we think that's like Merry Wives of Windsor or something? Trans, or do you think it's just like it's, it's just one of these? Oh, it could just be Caesar and um, uh, Pompey. I would guess and, it's very similar to uh, Henry the Fourth. It's probably not the same exact play. It probably is like a reworked, edited, censored version. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, it, it's probably from the same bare bones. And, like, to be fair, our folio version of Henry IV is probably not the same thing that played in 1597 or 1598 with the Chamberlain's men or whoever showed it. Um, so what we have is very polished and reworked. As, as you were pointing out earlier, that like, yeah, we see these plays over and over. And do you think they're just showing the same exact play over and over? No, like, they're reworking it. They're making it better. That's something that theater does now. That is totally a norm. Um... Let me see. I wanted to find... Oh. Okay, here we go. Okay. Yeah, it was hard to uh, control F anything on this because uh, Philip Henslow doesn't spell anything correctly. But, <laughs> yeah, I was about to say. But here we go. Mr. Dickers and Mr. Chettle, 26th of May, 1599, an earnest of a book called Troilus and Cressetta, The Tragedy of Agamemnon. And they're getting paid pretty big money to write that too. Uh, and they're continuing to get paid to rework it. And so they're reworking it uh, into 1599. Uh, we may see it again. I'm not sure. Um, and so that's something else you'll see is you'll see them write a play and then start, start writing another play, but then they'll go back and rework a play. Like that's something uh, that we actually see very literally in here. Um, Oh, that that may be 
I was sure that we saw Troilus if we said it one more time, but that may be it for here. Um, but I would like to suggest that that's absolutely Shakespeare's Troilus and Griselda. It's the same exact play. Um, read stuff that's supposed to be Henry Chettle. Read stuff that's supposed to be Thomas Decker. Go read Troilus and Cressetta. Tell me it doesn't feel like those two got together and wrote a play. Please, please, uh, go do that. And it's one that gets listed as one of Shakespeare's problem plays sometimes because it's not easy to define as a genre. It's, it's a tragedy, but it's not strictly a tragedy about the people like that are the title, like Troilus and Cressetta, they are sort of main characters, but they're not really. The main character is Ulysses, um, or maybe even Achilles. Um, and so what I think that play is actually about is really the Exus, Essex Rebellion and uh, the Essex Revolution and uh, that, that whole scene and the, kind of the failure of that scene or the, in, in, um, the uh, sort of... Uh, upcoming failure, the, the imminent doom that is about to be for this faction. And, uh, yeah, I, I think you'll see that the Ulysses character is very, very Francis Bacon-like and uh, that sort of thing. But it makes sense that that's Thomas Decker and Henry Chettle, and that that's just getting reproduced and reperformed for the Chamberlain's men and that were much later just adding Shakespeare's name. Um, maybe the best version of it, see if I can find it, uh, all the way in one thirties, is we get uh, an entry for Caesar's fall, and so that's why I said earlier. Um, here we go. Okay, one sixty six. We're all the way in sixteen oh two. This is almost at the end of it. Um, but this is why I said like we can have plays that already played and we're already plays, and then he'll put them, put them in here like it's a new entry, like it's a new play. Because we've already had two parts of Caesar. Like, how can there be another play about Caesar's fall? Um, it's likely that, yeah, it's that original play, but it needs so much reworking that you might as well call it a new rewrite. Um, and so, who's writing it? Uh, Anthony Monday, Michael Drayton, Middleton, and the rest. So it's more than just those three names. Um, let me see. Uh, it will get listed again here in a second. We also get the second part of Wolsey. That could very well be our Sir Thomas More play. Lots of people have suggested that. Um, here we go. Uh, here's one called Two Shapes. People have suggested maybe that's also... Um, Caesar, because it's the same exact writers that we'll see listed for Caesar, but it's Thomas Decker, it's Michael Drayton, it's Thomas Middleton, it's John Webster, and it's Anthony Monday. These are some of the best, in my opinion, of, of the group. So it makes sense that they're going to put out something awesome like Caesar. Um, oh, here's another one. I was literally just about to control F this one. Um, Lint. Unto Benjamin Johnson, or ben Benjamin Johnson, at the appointment of Edward Allen, who's a <clears throat> big-time actor, and William Byrd, who's an actor slash writer, um, an earnest of a book called Richard Crookback, and for new editions for Geronimo. So wait, Richard Crookback? That's Richard III. That's unquestionably Richard III. Anybody that wants to say it's some similar rival play, that's absurd that Benjamin... Ben Johnson's going to go write the same exact play as Shakespeare like 10 years later and just pitch it as his own? No. Uh, it's another one that we've probably already seen it with Richard the Confessor and it's being reworked even better. And Ben Johnson's getting paid to rework it even better. Um, and, so, and they're also getting paid to rework Geronimo, which you think is a kid, or they say is a kid yeah, play. So, like, this so is, therefore, there's already even more evidence of like so much group collaboration on top of that. You right. Know, so. Even if Ben Johnson's not some incognito guy that's the same incognito yeah. guy as Thomas Kidd, like, we already see that there's multiple workings over of these plays. And so if you read, Tom, uh, if you read Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy and you think it's pretty awesome, like, well, shit, shoot, yeah, it should be. 
We have Ben Johnson working on it. Ben Johnson's like the greatest thing ever. Maybe saw on Shakespeare. Um, so like, and the same thing for Richard III. Go, go read the opening of Richard III and tell me that's not the same guy that wrote The Alchemist or same lady or same group of people. Um, because, yeah, the, the opening of Richard III is maybe the best thing in all of Shakespeare, as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely love the first act of Richard III. Um, okay. That's maybe about where I wanted to go with this. There's, but, yeah, we could just keep going and going and going, okay. like you kind of said earlier. Here we go. Uh, I said earlier that the orphan's tragedy could be Hamlet. This one's one that's maybe way more likely to be Hamlet. Um, 1602, we're right at the right around when Hamlet would be getting written and produced or if it's reworked from the Thomas Kidd or Hamlet as they say uh, this is when it would be getting reworked to 1602 it's right when it comes out 1602 1603 what's it called a tragedy called the Danish tragedy yeah definitely <laughs> yeah like come on dude like because uh, it's yeah it's based on obviously the Danish story of Amleth or whatever right right uh, similarly we got one right here uh, Thomas Decker's an earnest of a comedy called Medicine for a Cursed Wife. Um, a lot of people have had this big giant confusion about the difference between the taming of a shrew and the taming of the shrew. One is supposedly, you know, uh, the actual Shakespeare play, and one is supposedly maybe a stolen copy that gets bastardized, or maybe it's an early version of the play that was maybe written by Marlowe and then Shakespeare takes it and reworks Taming of the Shrew into what he writes. Um, but what I would suggest is the early version that we've seen in here is the early version that we say is the early version. The thing that we call the Shakespeare version is this, A Medicine for a Cursed Wife. That's Taming of the Shrew. The early one is Taming of a Shrew. This is Taming of the Shrew. That's how that works. Um, and it's probably not exactly one-to-one -one like that, but the much nicer reworked version is probably the one being worked on here. Um, let me see. Okay, here's another interesting one. And uh, there's probably not too many more I want to show you guys. But uh, this one's not even a Shakespeare one. This is a... Went under the company to pay William Byrd and Samuel Rowley for their additions in Dr. Faustus. Hmm. So, that's Marlowe. This dude's supposed to be dead ten years. Um, and... This isn't even Big Shot Ben Johnson or anything. But what I will say is that unlike the Ben Johnson thing where nobody says Ben Johnson's hand is in Shakespeare's Richard III, um, pretty much all scholars acknowledge that the Faustus B version as opposed to the Faustus A version has the Rowley and Bird editions. So I just want to show there's a little bit of a double standard here where they will acknowledge what the Henslow Diary is telling them when it's convenient for them. And maybe when it's too hard for them to sort of hide or argue against, but um, sometimes they just kind of cherry-pick. Oh, no, that, that's not Shakespeare. That's a different play. Trollus and Cressetta, even though it's got the same exact title, no, a different play. Can we read it? No, we don't have it. Yeah, yeah, that's the other thing. It's like, okay, well, let me let me read Trollus and Cressetta by Decker and Chettle to see exactly how much it does influence the Shakespeare play. Well, uh, you, you can't read that. Why not? Uh, there's no copies. There's not a copy. There's no copy. Okay. But we do conveniently have this other fully furnished copy of a play called Troilus and Cressetta that we have no idea when it was written, when it was shown, uh, why it was written or why it was shown, uh, which that is actually the case with Troilus and Cressetta. Uh, there's a lot of open debate and discussion for when it's written and shown. You'll, it's not in the stationer's register until 1609, which that's definitely too late, even for Stratfordian purposes like uh, but they won't ever go date it to you know 1599 or 1600 because well, that's too close to the Henslow diary and so they'll kind of pick a convenient nebulous date somewhere around Hamlet um, which we saw here like we all we did was have to scroll a little bit to get from <laughs> from here and yeah maybe it's a, a difference of a few years but uh, as we've also shown plays can stick around for a few years very very easily and as we've also shown, they can get reworked very, very easily. Even yeah, even after you're dead, and uh, yeah, copyright's a joke, I guess, <laughs> for them. <laughs> so yeah, Marlowe's dead, and it's like yeah, just rework his Doctor Faustus for us. Rework his uh, uh, one of the other ones. Like, I think he's, that they did. Maybe I'm thinking of the kid one. But here's another interesting one. 
went on to Thomas Downton uh, to pay Middleton for a prologue, an epilogue, for the play of Bacon. So we don't have any William Shakespeare plays in here, but we actually have a fucking Francis Bacon play in here. Like, come on, guys. Like, come on, strats. What? You, wh what? Like, yeah, literally, play of Bacon. Do he doesn't have to say Francis. He doesn't have to capitalize it. You know exactly who he's talking about. And what he's talking about is a court mask. Um, and so Bacon was known to do court masks and court plays, which aren't, like, full plays. And that's what Stratfordians would be like, oh, Bacon didn't write real plays. He just wrote court masks. It's like, yeah, so did Ben Johnson. That was, like, where Ben Johnson made his bread and butter is court masks. Um, so, like, what do you talking about the guy couldn't write plays um so yeah that one's fun and uh, also i'm not sure exactly how to untangle thomas middleton or identify his authorship or who he is um but go read thomas middleton and almost every thomas middleton play the two main characters are francis and anthony uh, which is the bacon brothers uh, so just yeah like it's hard to read middleton and not make super baconian readings if any of you baconians have not read thomas middleton Go start doing that. There's tons of tons of stuff in there. Um, but uh, let me see. There's some other names in here. Uh, just scrolled past Thomas ha Howard. That's Thomas Haywood. Uh, he's another kind of big timer for me. Uh, he's one that we'll see when we go into the Sir Thomas More manuscript that he's supposed to be one of the writers. And um, Pretty much any time you read a clown scene in Shakespeare, I would say odds are that's probably Thomas Haywood. Uh, for whatever reason, he gets relegated to the clown scenes in this group effort. But um, Thomas Haywood's also supposed to have written like 200 plays or been a part of writing 200 plays, according to Thomas Haywood. Um, but Thomas Haywood's also one of the ways that we identify Kid is writing some of the stuff that he did. And uh, so Thomas Haywood has a quote about uh, Thomas Kid that says um, he was... Uh, the, he was sporting kid, um, you know, like suggesting he was always game to, to write stuff. So um, that's another thing. Uh, maybe that's kind of a final point I want to make here is that let's go back to our list here and let's look at it real quick. We got all these names, Sans Shakespeare, maybe Sans Marston, maybe Sans a couple more, but all these names are in the Henslow Diary. Actually, Marston's in the Henslow Diary. He just doesn't work exclusively for Henslow or work mainly for Henslow, really work for Henslow at all. Um, we have all these names, right? Um, we have these names that we crossed out. Um, but, like, these names that we crossed out, the way that we know about them are from these names that aren't crossed out. So what we know about Thomas Kidd comes from Ben Johnson. It comes from Thomas Haywood. What we know about Robert Greene's death comes from Thomas Nash. And I, I crossed out Thomas Nash, but he's not necessarily dead. Um, what we know about um, Christopher Marlowe comes from the mouth of Ben Johnson. Um, sorry, Chris Marlowe somewhere else over here. Oh, Chris Marlowe's over here. Um, but I want to sort of show that, like, We've taken on face value that all these old guys indeed exist exactly as we think they did, but so much of what we consider valid information, I consider suspect because it's coming from these people that perfectly take over the lives of these people that they're talking about. And at some point, I think it's just a really tongue-in-cheek way for, say, Ben Johnson's Philip Sidney. Um, it's a really tongue-in-cheek way for Philip Sidney to make a comment about who he was in the past. And so um, it's a really tongue-in-cheek way for, you know, if uh, Francis Bacon is Thomas Decker, uh, you know, and Thomas Nash, and helped write stuff with, Th with Robert Greene, who, say, becomes Henry Chettle, like, of course, he's going to have some funny quips to say about the supposed death. Um, so maybe a more holistic way of stating this is I want you to think about a lot of these names less as for certain uh, factual historical figures and I want you to think of them more as maybe characters that are built from historical narratives um, 
yeah, some of those historical narratives are really well built to the point where we have, you know, documentation and stuff. But um, a lot of the documentation can be after the fact and can be, you know, made up itself. And some of that documentation can be real and uh, actually pertains to some other factual thing. But the way that it's framed makes us think that, oh, it means something else in a factual manner. Um, you know, uh, for instance, like maybe the, the Shakespeare signatures. We always think the Shakespeare signatures are this big time factual important thing, but what nobody tells you about the Shakespeare signatures, all those come from 16 or 12 or 16, 12 or after. Like that's really late in this whole Shakespeare phenomenon. And uh, I'll go to one last quote here. Um, and this is from Folger, so this is the Shakespeare Library essentially. Um, by about 1600, particular playwrights, including most specifically, Shakespeare, Ben Johnson, uh, maybe a few others, but they specifically say those two. Um, I would say Marlowe as well. Um, they've developed a kind of cult celebrity. Um, and so as such, play, cor uh, play quartos, which is what they get printed on, uh, the title pages begin to note the author's names around this time. So for the first time ever, you start seeing playwrights' names heavily published on the printings of their plays in the late 90s into the 1600s. I would like to say this is when the construction is fully happening. Yes, it's, it's already been a pen name since Venus and Adonis, but constructing it into a persona that's an actual person, that's an actual actor and playwright, this is happening concurrently with the Henslow Diary, you know, peak years, the late 90s. And I think it's specifically because of this stable of writers that that phenomenon is able to happen. Um, and so, like, even Folger, they, I don't think they see the irony in this statement, but, like, this statement kind of shows that, like, look, uh, Shakespeare's not this known quantity until later, if not late, in his career. And as such, like, any of the early stuff that we try to, you know, apply as purely factual, that's, you know, it's conjectural at best. And uh, we need to kind of note it as such and not keep relying on it as fact. Um, okay, I think that about wraps it up. This one went a little bit longer than I wanted it to. I was trying to be quick. I knew I was going to get a little bogged down. I did my best. Um, Hopefully, yeah, you find it just as fascinating as we do, because yeah, it's hard not to just like start scrolling through this and start yeah asking the questions of like, well, how does the official historian sort of frame all this stuff, and how do they tell us this? And then that's when you I've been kind of saying that yeah, it's like a, a 4D Sudoku here, and you're having to like line up all these holes and be like, wait, they said this about this, and they've got a double standard for why they credit that is okay, but this is not, and so that's when you have to sort of. You know, use your own judgment to be like, well, I don't, I don't think I believe that anymore. What sort of, you know, I, if I align the holes properly, what makes more sense to us? Absolutely. And so that's sort of where we ended up, you know, with not just the group theory itself, but, uh, and, yeah, viewing all these artifacts in that sort of uh, context, you know? And, like, uh, this is something I want to make a point of. Like, there's a lot of uh, Shakespeare and authorship stuff going on out there, and... Uh, so much of it is trying to make internal readings. And I'm an English teacher. I'm a vociferous reader. I love internal readings. I love close readings. But um, I've wondered in the last few years here if we're not losing the forest for the trees because it's turned almost into this like ridiculous cryptography competition where you got Alexander Waugh and... and strip matter and, and his little oxfordian gang and they're making all their cryptic oxfordian readings and ultimately all their cryptic oxfordian readings ever pan out to is just like oxford was here or hey look I i'm edward de vere and i'm shakespeare drink your ovaltine yeah yeah like uh, it doesn't really add up to anything beyond that and i would like to see some theory developed beyond just hey this is my guy and uh i think we need to, in order to do that, we need to synthesize a lot of disparate information. And so going super deep and making these close readings on these like sort of esoteric, um, I don't want to say fully irrelevant, but like kind of tangential things. So like, you know, yeah, maybe the, the folio dedication is a pretty big one, but like Willow Bean is a visa. Like I'm not going and decoding the title page to Willow Bean is a visa 
to see a Devere signature. Like, I'm not doing that. Um, at some point, we have to look at just a little drier documents in a little drier way, and we need to kind of cross-examine these documents because there's plenty of stuff out there. I don't, I don't need to go dig into Willoughby and as a visa. I'm not saying it's not worthwhile. I'm not saying there's not information there. But, like, let's just real quickly, real briefly cross-examine the Henslow Diary with, say, the Book of Sir Thomas More. Or let's cross-examine those two with the Parnassus plays. Or let's cross-examine, uh, say, those two, and or, or those three, and uh, compare it to all the um, phenomenon of Samuel Daniels stuff lining up with Shakespeare stuff in the mid-90s. Or Thomas North. Yeah, or let, let's try and compare all that stuff to the, the Thomas North phenomenon that Dennis McCarthy has shown us. Like... Um, how does all of that line up? How can we reconcile all that disparate information? Um, you know, Peter Moonson has that two-hour documentary where he's digging treasure by the end because he found a treasure map in the folio. Like, that's that's awesome stuff, and that's definitely further than drink your Ovaltine. But like, how does that relate back to other Baconian texts, or how does that relate to you know Oxford's being buried in Westminster Abbey? Where does John D come up in all that? Like, let's cross-examine all that. Um, and that's, yeah, I guess we, we, you almost strayed into the territory. Because I feel like that's where some of, like, you know, the other people don't want to stray too much. They'll be like, oh, yeah, look at all this philosophy, you know, that the, oh, Rosicrucian this or Freemason that. But then when you really start to dive into, like, well, what are the repercussions of someone believing or maybe subtly dropping it in all the, you know, popular literature of the time. Like, what does all that mean? Like, what are all these other connections going on? Like, they don't really hear much geopolitics stuff. You may hear, like, the drama of, like, some of these, like, little personal lives and all the Devere stories, but, like, what's the bigger overarching kind of, like, moving of story yeah. of this, like, yeah, the human story sort of happening all behind yeah, the, they, the backdrop, Yeah, they just you know? act like it's, um... In, in a vacuum, you know? Just, yeah. yeah, it's all, it's all, but, you know, where we've got this sort of crazy, oh, no, because English to us, you know, is our, you know, native tongue. It, yeah, we've got this huge thing about this sociolinguistic construct that Shakespeare has sort of given to us, right? right. And so we're trying to, like, backtrack, like, what is it even like to not even have all these references and allegories given to the, by these writers, you know? And, yeah, just extrapolating out, like, what are the ramifications of even being aware of this sort of thing in itself? Right, like, if... If we want to talk about all the secret society stuff, which we are totally open for, like, what are the deeper, yeah, like you said, ramifications? What are the deeper motivations? It's, it's not just look at us, look at how cool we are, we can make you read the stuff that we want you to read. Like, it's definitely part of the agenda, but, like, that's not the whole crux of their method or message. And, um, yeah, so, like, I would like to see more synthesis of these ideas. I would like to see just more broadening of perspective where we can start to make heads or tails of these sort of like almost contextless events and moments and people. Um, and for instance, maybe we were even talking about, and we talked about this in our very first or second episode, I don't quite recall. It's one of the first two. But like you were just saying, you were looking through the Henslow diary and you were kind of making a note of how this currency was sort of like changing over time, right? But this is exactly during the period that Elizabeth is, you know, redoing a bunch of this monetary stuff. They're minting a bunch of new coins and, you know, sort of, you know, but that's got to do with empire building. That's got to do with all this sort of like, you know, geopolitics of the whole world and how they're interacting with all these other nations and yada yada, you know? So there's just, yeah, this overarching, yeah, like story, this hyper object that we're sort of trying to grasp and... Yeah, trying to like and pull the strings. By no slowly. means is Shakespeare the only point, or maybe even the main point. It just seems right. like the most easily accessible to understand its sort of influence and grasp on us. Uh, and so it's maybe the easiest way for us to dive into the hyper object. It's a key. And, you know, um, I think a lot of you secret society types out there like that it's it's a key to sort of unlock this treasure map and and find stuff and like i said with the moon I mean, he made a very literal treasure map but it, um as he will even tell you it's not just this literal treasure map it's this sort of hermetic philosophical treasure map to unlocking history language and all that and uh, whether or not that was the purposeful intent i think it functions like that um so i guess we'll end on that uh, it's a very nice general broad ending to tie all the theme together 
Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, go look at Hensla Diary yourself. Go look at Sir, Book of Sir Thomas More. Um, go look at just any document you can from that area uh, era, and really try and ask yourself: Does this document make sense? Does all, do all these things sort of line up? And if they do, what what can I, you know, sort of extrapolate from that? Um, so thanks for listening. Um, keep checking in. We're going to keep posting. Like I said, in the future, we're going to have some more streamlined, but for now, uh, just rocking this whole, uh, long podcast with, uh, the charts and just kind of pouring through the documents. And, uh, uh, just want to say thanks for you guys that have, uh, listened and, uh, been following us for several episodes here. Any of you new listeners, please stick around. Uh, we're going to keep doing this hopefully often, but even if we're gone for a few weeks or months, we're coming back. So, uh, this, this discussion's not ending anytime soon. Yeah, it was going on long before we ever turned on the microphone and started actually making anything proper recording, but, uh, yeah, it, it will never leave us. And, oh, I wanted to do this at the beginning, but we can sign off with it. Uh, as, you know, consumers of not just buying books, because that's a different hobby than reading the books, uh, I'll admit, but, uh, yeah, I wanted to just, uh, I wanted to start off and ask you, uh, and maybe we'll always check in, but I was going to say, what book are you currently reading right now? And I always just do your, your little shout-outs for whatever books you're uh, currently on. Oh, uh, man, um, yeah, I'll, I'm going to be quick about this, because I've been reading a bunch lately, but uh, right now I'm on uh, Robert Stone's Hall of Mirrors, and that's his debut novel, and... Um, Several folks uh, consider it maybe one of the greatest debut novels by an American or English writer, maybe just period. Um, I'm sort of inclined to agree. I've read his, dog, his more famous novel, Dog Soldiers. If any of you guys read that and enjoyed it, check out Hall of Mirrors. I think it's as good, if not better. I haven't gotten fully into the action, but the uh, first 100 pages of introduction and sort of exposition and getting the conflict rolling... Uh, it's all just fantastic writing. Uh, Stone's very, very gifted, and uh, you should check it out. Um, real quick, I know that's the one I'm reading, but let me give a couple other shout-outs for the ones that I have been reading since we haven't been on lately. Uh, check out King Casey, sometimes a great notion. Uh, the book's extraordinary. Maybe just the greatest book ever written. Um, and maybe also another one that can deserve that title. Uh, this one really blew my socks off. Uh, partly just because it's from 1956. And, like, any of you guys that think Ginsburg or Kerouac are, are good stuff, go read Nelson Algren. Read A Walk on the Wild Side by Nelson Algren. That's where the Lou Reed title comes from. That book is amazing. Uh, and then, last but not least, maybe the, the super deep-cut shout-out that I want to give uh, is a, a writer named Andrew Little, Andrew Nelson Little. Uh, you know little trigger warning he does come from a pretty racist awful southern background but um so do many of our sort of heralded writers you know william faulkner is not you know innocent to that uh but i would say uh, andrew little's velvet horn is every bit as good as any faulkner novel i've ever touched i think he's doing the faulkner thing better uh it's from the 50s so it's a little later but it's totally got the modernist southerner feel thing going and uh it's extraordinary so yeah, check, check out uh, uh, the, those four books. Those are the ones I'm going to put my super seal of approval. There's some others that, yeah, yeah, go, ch go check out uh, John Ella's Landbreakers. Um, um, let's see. Yeah, go, ch go check that one out as well. Um, but uh, those four, whew, if you're looking for a good novel and you haven't come across those yet and you're maybe into some uh, 20th century lit, whew, check it out. But thanks for asking that, dude. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I meant to start that. it off in the beginning because it's always good. Because yeah, just we're always into books, and obviously, you know, we'll read something and be like, oh, you know, Philip Sidney's in here, <laughs> or uh, whatever. Oh, there's a Shakespeare shout out here, or blah 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 blah. And uh, yeah, it's always it's always gonna. And I guess on that note, I'll give one more shout out. Uh, me and me and my roommate Jamie have been watching all these '50s movies, trying to go through 1950 all the way through 1959 in chronological order, kind of watch the best of. And uh, our most recent one we watched was 12 Angry Men. What a film. What an excellent film. And, you know, I think it's relevant not just because it's a good film. Like, those other books are good books, but they're not necessarily relevant. This one's super relevant because it's about trying to parse through what seems like given information and using doubt, using skepticism, using, you know, um, open-mindedness uh, to cross-examine and 
better analyze you know the information and, and uh, logic set of stuff that you got to come up with a better answer like the start of the you know spoiler alert start of the movie everybody thinks he's guilty by the end of the movie yeah, maybe not and it's because Henry Fonda's character the juror number seven is constantly asking everybody to take a step back fully explain themselves if they can't fully logically explain themselves then there's more work to be done and that's where we're at so that ties full through together uh, any Shakespeare video you're watching any documents you're reading any Shakespeare you're reading keep that open mind channel your inner Henry Fonda and you know just understand the possibility and strength of doubt under, uh, understand the strength and possibility of using logic to cross-examine understand the possibility uh, and strength of your own biases like those will lead you to bad paths but those will also help you understand why you want to go down those paths and so that it, you know all those things keep in mind uh, that's it let's wrap it up here uh, thanks for listening hope you all have a good one uh, stay tuned we'll be uh, coming out with another video shortly yeah thanks guys Adios.